I don't know how this is going to work out. It's going to be 10 minutes, four demonstrations going on. I think some of the four most profound demonstrations, talk experiments in the history of physics. <laughs> it never gets presented in physics as being something that's interesting. It's just a series of stuff to learn off by heart. I'm going to try and remedy that by giving you a feel for how bizarre, how revolutionary this world of physics was from the years 1800 right up to about 1910, 1915. We're going to look at the nature of matter and as a result, or tied in with that, is the nature of waves and to show that two things are intrinsically linked. So some of the stuff you'd have seen before, in fact almost all of it you'd have seen before, the end of it you will not have seen before and what that means for us uh, you will not have been introduced to before. So the first thing you would have seen before, we we're looking at basically at light and the nature of light itself. So we know around, Isaac Newton himself said that light was made up of particles. So as far as he was concerned, light was made up of little packets called particles. And because Isaac Newton was Isaac Newton, nobody questioned it. So he was 1600s, mid 1600s. So for another 150 years, nobody, with the exception of one or two rare individuals, questioned that. We now know that light is made up of waves, and we can prove it's made up of waves because interference. 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 And who was the first guy whose name is associated with that? That was shown. So in about 1801, he did something like this. His slits weren't this fancy, but all he got was a series of slits and got a monochromatic light, he didn't have a light source, so he used two slits, interfered to produce one slit, a monochromatic single wave of light, and you get something like this. Okay? So box standard, we've seen it before. If we change the laser light coming in, we get a different pattern. If we keep the original laser light going in, but change the diffraction gradient, we get a different pattern. And we can explain all of this using the wave formula that Thomas Jung gave us, which was So pretty conclusively, he showed something very important. One, Newton didn't have all the answers, so therefore there was a lot of science yet to be discovered. And two, light was made up of waves. It proves it. You cannot come up with that pattern if light is made up of particles. There is simply no way to do it. It was pretty close to a conclusive proof, as conclusive as you can get. Hunky dory. Let's move it along about 150 years up to the early 1900s. We now look at the electron. Around the early 1900s, People were discovering, from Rutherford, we knew that the matter is made up of a dense nucleus with negative charge going around the outside. So boys started doing some experiments with something called a cathode ray tube. Cathode is a negative part of the circuit. So they had a negative part of the circuit here. And bit by bit, they wanted to do experiments with what was coming out of the cathode itself. So they realized one of the problems was whatever was coming out of the cathode was being absorbed. So they had to do things in a vacuum. So they had to create a vacuum tube. So here's what we do here. We know from thermionic emission, we now know thermionic emission is what? The release of electrons from the surface of the hot metal. So here's what we do for start. <coughs> we get a hot metal. Simple filament light bulb is a hot metal. And I don't know if you can see that here. You probably can see it from there, Richard. Can you zoom right in? Yeah. You see this glow in there? Yeah. So what you got there is a tiny filament. Can the rest of you see that glow? Yeah. In there? If I turn it around like this. Yeah. Right. So all that's in there is a tiny filament. There are electrons being fired off of that due to thermionic emission. These boys wanted to do experiments. They didn't know what was coming off. They just referred to this as a cathode, right? The <coughs> negative part of the terminal. So all you had here right, is a simple terminal, positive and negative. That's all there is to it. They wondered what was coming out of here. So they started doing a hundred different things. One of the things that they did was they charged this guy positively to see what would happen. And lo and behold, when they charged this guy positively, so we turn it on and we're going to vacuum inside here. You can get all of that, Richard. And we're going to make it positive and we're going to make it positive on the order of a couple of thousand volts. So on it goes. I'll leave that. I'll leave that in. Uh, first of all, in, turn it on, and lo and behold, they're getting a spot over here. Still not sure about this whole notion of electrons, and they're more, more investigating just what's given off when a metal heats up. And they find they got this spot, and it's coming from the negative end of, an, uh, of a circuit, so they're calling it, it seems to be a stream of rays. They're calling it cathode rays. And that's why this apparatus is known as a cathode ray tube. So what you got is your first circuit just to heat up the filament, and over here then you've just got a charge very, very positive. Okay? So, and over here you've got, what's on the screen? 
to fluorescent. fluorescent screen so that when the electron gets here, it causes the electrons in the material to pop up a level, fall back down a level, and give off energy in this form in the, in the nature of green light. Right. So they started doing more and more investigations on this, and they realized this seems to have all the characteristics of something that's very, very small, very small mass, but it does have a mass, and something that's got a negative charge because it's being affected in a positive. So after a while, they realized this seemed to correspond with what other experiments were doing, where they were also coming across small particles that they called the electron. This seemed to correspond to fit all the characteristics of the electron, so therefore, this basically seems to be a screen of electrons. We then had a guy called Lorenz came along and he was able to look at what happens if you put, we know a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field experiences a force. The current carrying conductor is just normally a stream of electrons going along a copper wire. He said, well, if this is a stream of electrons, there's no copper wire here, but nevertheless, if you put a magnetic field up to it, will it experience a force in the same way that a copper wire would literally deflect, right? So what he did was he got a magnetic field. Do we have a magnetic field, Richard? What do we do with magnetic field? That bench. <laughs> Magnets, perfect, that's all we want. Now, we have a living sort of physics, we know when I even jump up to it here. Can you just flick around and get this screen here, Richard? You have come across this on our chapter on the electron, this formula here. This describes something moving in a circle, F is mv squared over r. This describes BEV, the force acting on an electron in a magnetic field. Okay? E is the charge of an electron. V is the velocity. What is B? Magnetic flux. Magnetic flux. So therefore, we know if we equate the two of these guys, we have BEV equals MV squared over R. You can show the radius you get is determined by the mass of the particle. So in this case, you can get a nice simple animation of this. The, if an electron enters a magnetic field, it will start moving in a circular pattern. And the radius of the pattern is dictated in part by the mass of the charge. So back to here, one last time, if I play this, play it from the beginning, from the beginning, drag it all the way back to here. Reload the page. I'm afraid of that. There's no other way to do it. Let's reload the page and see what happens. Okay, it's working just in time. So it's entering a magnetic field. As soon as it enters a magnetic field, it starts to move in a circular fashion. This would be very important for what we see later on. All I'm trying to establish here is if it's moving in a circular pattern, reacting to a magnetic field, it's got a mass. So electrons have a mass, no big deal. We'll just demonstrate that down here. So we're moving on. Light is made up of waves. Electrons are made up of particles. They move in a magnetic field. And here I'm introducing my magnetic field due to a magnet. You got that, Richard? Yeah. And you can see it being deflected. It's deflected. It's the size of deflection depends upon the size of the magnetic field here, depends upon its velocity, and also depends upon its mass. No big deal. Electrons have mass. Okay? So far, so good. And around the same time, there was a demonstration we're all familiar with. Can I get the lights on, Julian, please, for this bit? Can I get the lights on there, please? Yeah. About halfway there.